Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Masser and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Bloomberg Business Week weekend podcast. Big focal point this week. I mean, massive focal point, let's be fair. Earnings from NVIDIA. You know, the giant chip maker at the heart of the artificial intelligence revolution that has powered the bull market in stocks. More on that in just a moment. And speaking of NVIDIA, Jensen Wong, Satya Nadella of Microsoft, and Michael Dell, a lot of big names in the tech space this past week talking about AI and their plans and their partnerships. Our take on what is going on from the head of AI over at Qualcomm, who weighed in on on-device artificial intelligence, including so-called AI PCs. You're going to hear a lot about that in the coming months, that's for sure. Venture Capital crossed into a few topics for us this week as well, including a conversation with the author of The Venture Mindset, How to Make Smarter Bets and Achieve Extraordinary Growth. And speaking of VC bets, Joanne Corcoran over at Golden Seeds joins us on investing in early-stage women-led businesses. And then the Business Week cover story. It's about 23 and Me once the recipient of millions of dollars from VCs and investors facing a big problem today. All of that to come, we begin with NVIDIA, which gave another bullish forecast shattering estimates, showing that spending on AI computing remains strong and reinforcing its stats as the biggest beneficiary of AI spending. The company's so-called AI accelerators, these are chips that help data centers develop chatbots and other cutting edge tools, have become a hot commodity. For more on the quarter and the business, we caught up with the Bloomberg News U.S. Semiconductor reporter, Ian King. Analysts were looking for doubling year over year in this current quarter. NVIDIA said, yeah, we can do that and we can do a bit more. Um, So even though there were lofty expectations, they managed to set expectations even higher. The data center business is already bigger than Intel and AMD and it's getting bigger quicker than people had projected more than 400 percent year on year increase in that particular business so all of the fundamental numbers that nvidia needed to show were heading in the right direction it was able to deliver on um i was i was a little struck and and carol mentioned this by a couple of the the things that they also announced the 10 to 1 stock split uh coming next month and then increasing the dividend curious if you have any thoughts on either of those things well, I mean, uh, you know, uh, as you were just discussing with Bailey, I believe that the stock split is something that's aimed at retail investors, but it's also aimed at uh, their inter- internal audience as well. A, a certain mm. percentage of the shares get bought by individuals. That, you know, they get like a discount slash, you know, a, a allowance that they can buy at a certain point. So, you know, they want to want to keep their employees happily, right? You need those engineers. You need those that staff that's that's you know and so invested in what you're doing so that might be part of it as well can i ask you though because i did scratch my head a little bit about it i don't know i was going back and forth with a, a brother of mine who has been in nvidia for years and we're going back and gotta get your brother on the show i, I what know does he know that yeah he's pretty smart just really did. well read um but about the dividend because i always feel like companies do that when maybe growth is slowing or something to kind of keep investors happy. Is there something, though, connected with that stock split that they raise the dividend so much? I mean, for semiconductor companies, which are massively capital intensive, even when they don't own their own manufacturing, the, the question is, how much are they spending as a percentage of their revenue on uh, R&D, on design, on making sure that the next product's mm-hmm. coming along? And you look, you know, NVIDIA is one of the highest, one of the biggest spenders by any measure in the chip industry. So as long as they're doing that, I would say that most NVIDIA watches don't care. It's just something nice to have on on the other side of things. Well, you talk about the R&D spend, um, and it really, you know, certainly seems to be paying off for NVIDIA. Having said that, talk to us about the development cycle. And I bring it up because I was listening uh, to Bloomberg Intelligence man Deep Singh about how for NVIDIA, it's kind of a shorter time, like almost every year, and that that is going to require companies who want to have the latest and greatest from NVIDIA and in the AI chip world, that they're going to be adjusting their CapEx spend to include that every year. So maybe, you know, different from, Moore's law, right? Basically what Jensen Wang, the CEO, said, he said, look, look, we were bringing new products to market for this market roughly sort of every 18 months or so. Mm-hmm. Now we're going to do it every year. We're going to do it every year for a number of reasons. He, you know, 
put the, 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 the salesman routine, look, we're helping our customers, this market is changing rapidly, so we need to bring stuff to the market much, much quicker than we were doing to help support this, to help bring these new capabilities. Everybody wins, everything, you know, the pace of innovation increases. Flip side of that is, you remember earlier this year we were talking about what AMD's doing, what Intel's doing. You know, how are they going to get into the market? And what Jensen Wang has basically said to them is like, that moving train that you are trying to catch is going even faster, good luck. Um, and, mm. and so that's what's really going on on a competitive basis there as well. And Moore's law, I meant doubling every two years. So forgive me. Yeah, so uh, much faster here. You know, Ian, I want to, to that end of this, of, of jumping on that train, I want to talk a little bit about margins because the company said that margins uh, for the, uh, the gross margins will be 75.75% in the uh, current quarter. Um, as you noted, this is more like a software company rather than a chip company. And you yesterday talked about Intel being in the low 60s at its height uh, when it really owned the server market. What can history tell us about the duration and durability of margins like this for a chip company? Yeah, I mean, right now, their margins are what they want them to be because it's just really a case of, well, our, our prices are sky high, we're sold out, we can essentially charge what we want, so obviously the pricing is very good for margins. On the flip side of that, as we just discussed, they can spend what they want. It's, you know, how much do we want to spend on R&D, how, how well do we want to reward our employees? So uh, the margins are sky high, but they could make them artificially higher. The fact that they're spending heavily, the fact that they're, they're able to charge a lot, that's something that's going to probably persist. So. They're setting very high targets, but they could be even higher. So, uh, you know, as a, as a measure of their health, it's, it's pretty good. Do you agree with Jensen's comment that the freight train is now moving faster and, and these companies will have a more difficult time? The AMDs and the like will have a more difficult time catching up with NVIDIA? I mean, Jen Jensen's racing. I mean, it, it, that's one of the things that comes across in pretty much any time he says something. He's constantly aware of the tension that mm. exists in his business and his market, and he's consciously trying to shape both what his company does and his understanding of the relationships, where we are in the cycle, where we are relative to the competition, what the customers want. He's trying to shape his narrative to fit that. He's very clever and he's showing people that he understands what's going on mm. and what he has to do to stay ahead and that kind of institutional paranoia that history of being the <laughs> yeah. little guy still very much present in what he's doing unbelievable and just a fascinating story um ian thank you i know it's been a busy 24 hours for you so we really appreciate it ian king our u.s semiconductor and networking reporter at bloomberg news joining us from our san francisco bureau as we mentioned nvidia shares continuing to trade higher still up about 10 percent in today's session and again you're now looking at a 2.5 almost 2.6 trillion dollar market cap company so it is in the league of some of the largest market cap companies in the world you're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. This past week, the CEOs of Dell, ServiceNow, and NVIDIA all at the Dell Technology World event in Las Vegas, talking about working together and on-premise AI. That conversation, by the way, can be found on the Bloomberg and at Bloomberg.com. Dell unveiled a new line of personal computers optimized for AI tasks, with Michael Dell saying AI PCs will be, quote, pretty standard in 2025. Meantime, Microsoft introduced a version of its Copilot Assistant to help teams collaborate, extending a company-wide push to infuse products with AI. Microsoft presenting new computers with the new AI-focused features, powered by chips from Qualcomm, a maker of smartphone components that's been trying to grab a foothold in laptops for years. A lot going on, folks, as you can tell. Well, so we felt pretty lucky when earlier this month we got our own take on all of this with Durga Malati, head of AI over at Qualcomm. There's a lot of things that are going on in the space of uh, uh, AI as it runs on devices that you and I uh, usually use, whether it's handsets or phones, whether it is uh, tablets or, or PCs and so on. So let me spend a little bit of time in terms of explaining what's really going on out there. So in the last two years or so, ever since uh, uh, generative AI started making waves in terms of its capabilities, uh, pretty spectacular capabilities in, in terms of uh, the, the kinds of use cases that it can unleash. Uh, as Qualcomm, we've been focused on trying to bring that technology into uh, devices that you and I can use. You know, usually one of the questions that comes in is why? 
why do you want to run this on a device why can't you just run it on the cloud i mean yeah. we do use the cloud for so many different things and and what's what's wrong actually so it's kind of important to understand what are the benefits that you actually have uh, when you run these uh, uh, like amazing generative AI models uh, directly on devices. Uh, the very first one is uh, related to uh, privacy and security. Okay. A lot of the times when you actually go through uh, generative AI use cases, uh, you might be wondering, maybe it's just a chatbot. Maybe I ask a question, I get a response. Uh, but it doesn't have to be just a chatbot. It could be these days we use a lot more of both voice-based uh, 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 interaction with devices in addition to using like camera and something else to bring in additional context mm -hmm. to the question that you're asking. <clears throat> For example, you could be holding up your phone and pointing in a certain direction and saying, what am I looking at? And, and that information, you want to actually do process it locally. You might not be fully comfortable actually dealing with all of this in the cloud. It, I, I totally get it why this makes sense to have on device, whether that's mm -hmm. a, a smartphone or a PC. We'll talk about PCs in just a minute. You said you've been working on this at Qualcomm. Why hasn't it happened yet? So uh, actually, if you take a look at it, so at least on the smartphone segment, if you take a look at some of the premium tier smartphones, whether it's uh, a Samsung Galaxy S24 or a, or a Pixel device or something that we are seeing in China with uh, Xiaomi and Honor and some of the other devices, all these devices now are capable of, based upon uh, uh, keeping aside the Pixel part, but everything else based upon Snapdragon platforms from Polcom, running very large language models directly on the device, up to 7 billion parameters. And these devices are now capable of a lot more things than you're used to. I do admit that the use cases are still gradually waking up to what are the capabilities mm. in the smartphone because okay. that is something that takes a little bit of time. But well, if you've kind of taken a look at some of the live translate features or AI-based voice assistants, the capability to run very large models directly on device starts today. It's already exists today uh, in in, uh, in smartphones and the use cases are gradually coming up and we're doing our part on the use cases as well as I kind of go through the, uh, the rest of the discussion. Durga, you, you guys have, um, you know, you've been talking about phones specifically, but I'm assuming that you're thinking also um, PCs as well. And I'm just curious if that's the case. And, you know, you guys have been trying for years to get into the PC market. Um, why though hasn't it happened so far and, and why maybe is it different this time around if that's also on your radar and your mission? Absolutely right. There is a massive disruption that's coming to this specific segment mm. in the context of AI PCs. Now the definition of AI PC is uh, it is a PC in which not only do you have like the equivalent of everyone has heard about co-pilots in which you're constantly using something else that is running with which you interact with quite frequently and use it for productivity, whether it's in creation of documents, edition of the uh, editing documents, or taking one uh, kind of a document and translating into another and so on and so forth. This is what, what we would call as like a on-demand right. AI. Okay. It's a little bit like a chatbot. You ask a question, you get an answer. Okay. There is more. Well, there is more to it. Well, okay, so if there's more, more to this, and we can, why do we need a, an AI PC to do this? Why can't we just do this on the powerful machines that we already have? Why do they need to be AI specific? So one thing that, I mean, these productivity tools are, are make, they make it significantly more simpler to actually not just interact with your device, but actually make it, a lot, a lot of the things that you end up doing tend to be far more richer in terms of the capabilities in itself. Let me give an example of that, by the way. <clears throat> Imagine that you're actually on a, on, a, on a chat session with your colleague and you're actually talking about uh, a specific meeting that you just had. And the next thing you know, something pops up saying, okay, uh, do you want me to share the meeting notes with the person? And you just click yes, and that immediately goes in. Just think through exactly all the things that happened in that whole process. First of all, this is now the equivalent of what we have been calling as pervasive AI. AI, which is constantly running inside your PC, it's actually kind of trying to encapsulate you as the end user and the PC into like one single state and you're constantly predicting, you're thinking on its, uh, you know, the PC is actually kind of almost thinking and anticipating the next move from the user and then being very uh, proactively helpful so in it, that whole process. So we've only got a couple of minutes though. So is that why we need an AI PC specifically? Combination in your of, view? The, yeah. of the two of the productivity tools plus this along with a few other things associated with uh, uh you know as a as a 
as a code generator or as a content creator. It is something that's constantly running in the background. Now, keep in mind that we use our PCs regardless of whether we are connected somewhere to the cloud or not. I mean, the simplest example is you might be on like a long flight and you want to actually get some work done during the flight, but all you have is just you and the laptop at that point in time, regardless of what the connectivity is. And you still want to have the same kind of productivity. So it does actually really start growing on you. Quite a few of us inside Qualcomm have been dogfooding exactly that experience with our own internal reference designs on these AI PCs. But, and but, trust me, it does change the but, user experience. But what does an AI PC do for the consumer? What do they get out of this, the, a regular consumer? A regular consumer, I mean, if you if you categorize between, we talked about productivity tools, let's talk about content creation. Content creation is also kind of a productivity in its own way, so that part is actually quite clear. But if you start thinking about all the other things, even when it comes to the social interactions and emails and documents and so on, a regular user at the end of the day goes through a mix and match of these different kinds of use cases. And we believe that it's actually a pretty big differentiator between the before and after. Now, is it like a big bang moment that happens? That is something that remains to be seen. But we are on the cusp of all these launches that are coming up over the next few weeks. And let's see how that plays out. Do you want me to be replaced, Carol, by an AI <laughs> PC? <laughs> is that what you're hinting at? I mean, come on, no. Not gonna happen. No, no. Uh, hey, an avatar, not gonna happen perhaps? this year. <laughs> an avatar, <laughs> avatar to prepare for the show, and then the real life. Yes, yes. Carol and Tim get to do the avatars show. can do the do yeah. all the work, and uh, and then we just step in. Yeah, I'm I'm with, I'm down with that. Durga, thank you so much. Really appreciate uh, getting some time with you, Durga Malati. He's head of AI over at Qualcomm, joining us uh, from San Diego. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Listen live each weekday starting at 2 p.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. As we mentioned, this past week, we heard from the CEOs of some very well-known companies, you know, Microsoft, Dell, NVIDIA, to name a few. And yes, they are household names today, but uh, they weren't when they got their start many years ago when they asked for the help of venture capitalists and their venture money. So what was it that made a venture capitalist or a group of them or a VC firm decide to invest and make a financial bet on them over others? What were they thinking and how can their thinking help you even if you don't work in venture capital? Which brought us to Ilya Strebuleyev. He's professor of private equity and finance at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business and founder and director of the Venture Capital Initiative. His new book, The Venture Mindset, How to Make Smarter Bets and Achieve Extraordinary Growth. The first principle to follow is why home runs matter and strikeouts don't. Because you talked about success, which is home runs for VCs, and failure, which is about strikeouts. And the Venture Mindset is could be described as the new mental mindset that you should follow in the innovation-driven world, where you face a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unpredictability. And uh, VCs have been facing this hostile environment for more than 50 years. Do you know that if you look at all the companies that became public in the United States in the last 50 years, every second one of them was venture-backed. Do you know that six or seven or eight companies out of top 10 by market cap today were venture-backed when they were small companies? And moreover, as my research shows at Stanford, there's causality, which means that had there been no venture capital industry, likely there would have been no many, many of those companies that changed our lives, such as Apple, Netflix, Airbnb, Microsoft, mm -hmm. Nvidia, and so on. Well, what do you make, though, of the venture mindset back in the 1999-2000 era when it seems like money was just thrown at anything with a dot-com after it? That is a great question. First of all, uh, what we discuss in our book is FOMO, F-O-M-O, -O, which is fear of missing out. But what is really interesting is that uh, smart VCs are trying to avoid FOMO as much as possible. And one way to avoid it is uh, what a friend of mine, Alex Rampel from Anderson Horowitz, calls it conviction must beat consensus, which means that if everybody is trying to invest in something, maybe that is time to invest in something else. So if we look in the late 1990s, 
or indeed if you look at uh, crypto or if you look at some other bubbles in the last uh, 10 15 years many of them were driven in fact by investors that were not following the venture mindset principles in fact hmm. in the 1990s there were also a lot of amazing companies born and a lot of investors made great investing de investment decisions i'm wondering about the idea of saying no more often than you say yes so first of all this is the principle called say no 100 times <laughs> when we think about how venture capitalists make decisions for each investment they make they say no more than 100 times wow. okay now if you think about this if you spend a lot of time trying to decide how to make this nose how to say this knows in fact you will have no time to proceed with a good due diligence so what venture capitalists do to make it more efficient? What I've discovered is that they use two different decision-making modes at the beginning and at the end of their journey with each deal. At the beginning or at the top of their deal funnel, they use what I call the fast lane approach. And at the bottom, they use the slow lane approach. And I think all of us can benefit from this. So what is the fast lane approach? You are approaching the potential investment opportunity or indeed uh, any potential decision by asking why should I not proceed with even thinking about this investment decision. So this not is critical. If you ask instead why should I do it, then you will go down a completely different path. They're asking themselves the question why we should not do it and then try to identify a red flag. So they use red flags and red flags could be different for different types of investments. But once they hit a red flag, they will stop thinking about investing in this opportunity and will move on. Here is a quick example for you. Let me take back you to 2007, when the first iPhone was released. And uh, file sharing was in the air, but was not yet possible because there was no Wi-Fi, there were no smartphones. One investor of Sequoia Capital at the time, his name was Samir Gandhi, was very interested in this. And with his partners, he tried to prepare his mind. He tried to meet with a lot of startups. He, I think, met with like more than 50 teams that were developing file sharing. Mm -hmm. And he decided not to invest in any. He said no to every single one of them. Why? Because they hit his red flag. What is his red flag? Well, it turns out that to be his red flag was, I wanted to meet, he told me, a team from whom I could learn how to do it. You know, nobody was doing this, right, right, but I spent a lot of time trying to identify what that was. And I meet, was meeting with those teams and then I was not learning anything. And then he met with two guys who didn't have any money. I actually think they didn't have the money to fly across the country. They took a Greyhound, so they didn't have a prototype. And then they met with the Sequoia partners. And I think in about half an hour, okay. there was a decision to proceed with the investment. Why? Because even though those two guys did not know, they did not could not do anything. They, in fact, threw, thought through all cranes and nooks about how they're going to implement everything, how they're going to execute everything. And so Sequoia ended up investing in what turned out to be Dropbox. But that is the power of saying no 100 times. Otherwise, mm. you would not end up in Dropbox. You would end up with, with, mm. with another failure, another strikeout. It's like when I shop. <laughs> what, go on. No, 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 no. Okay, do it. No, I'm having fun with you. But I do wonder if you have some thoughts, though, on artificial intelligence and how it might help uh, a venture capitalist go through deals. I think, you know, last year we were having conversations about how that it could help a VC investor who might not look at some smaller deals because it just wasn't worth their time. But if you use some kind of AI screening who can kind of go through some of it, it might bring some deals that they might have said no on before, might bring it to their attention. But any smart kind of thought about that? in terms of um, how that might help venture capitalists still kind of stick to their, you know, red flags and their mindset, but also provide maybe some new opportunities. AI is going to be very helpful for VCs. And the reason behind this is because one of the principles of the venture mindset is getting outside four walls, which means that you are trying to diversify where your sources come from. For example, uh, a friend of mine who is a venture capitalist in San Francisco, his name is Paul Arnold. Um, he is the founder of, of a Switch VC. So he and his team develop an algorithm. They go through LinkedIn and uh, other websites every single day. And the moment 
there is a founder who is working on some kind of stealth startup mm. or studying anything new, it, that founder will go into the algorithm. Mm. And then the algorithm churns, and some of the founders, according to some criteria, will kind of bubble up so that sometimes Paul will identify founders far away from Silicon Valley, far away from uh, California, that are working on something interesting. So, but that is getting more sources. Yeah. So then to identify which of those sources are going to be good, you have to go back to the venture mind's principles of saying no 100 times. Well, so I think AI is mostly working at the beginning of the funnel or right. expanding the funnel, not at uh, the final uh, process of the funnel. So here, the venture capitalists still make the decisions themselves. Ilya, you know, you talk about red flags by venture capitalists, and I do wonder about, here we are once again talking about black entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs still struggling to kind of get seen and get that VC money. It just doesn't flow like it does um, to white men. It's just, you know, you know the numbers, you know the data, I don't need to explain it to you. So is it because for a venture capitalist that comes up as a red flag? What is that about? That is a great question. And I think that is a very important problem these days. First of all, let me go back and tell you about one of my research studies. What we did is we created with my PhD student 50 fake startups. Hmm. We had a lot of fun creating those stuff <laughs> with fake <laughs> websites, fake profiles, and so on. And then we created 200 fake founders. Why 200? Because each startup had four fake founders. Either it had a white man founder, a white woman, an Asian man, or an Asian woman. And then we sent, we created blurbs, decks, and, and whatnot. And we sent the emails from, from these fake founders about these fake startups to actual venture capitalists, also to actual uh, active angel investors. We sent in total about 80,000 emails. Mm -hmm. And we checked the responses. And when I say the response, what we say is a, a positive response. For example, um, can we meet uh, on Zoom for a chat? Can you send us the pitch deck? Um, can you go and meet my partner who is interested in this deal and so on? First of all, what we really found interesting is that the response rate was very high. You know, when I started this project, every single VC whom I talked to told me not to do it because they don't respond to call calls. We got between 8% and 15%, like every 12th to every 6th venture capital and angel investor responded. Right. In fact, most successful VCs were more likely to respond. And we also found out that venture capitalists, the most successful ones, tend to respond more to female entrepreneurs huh. and to Asian entrepreneurs as well. So the conclusion here is, is that it is not at the beginning of the process where the problem lies. It's typically lies towards the end of the process. And here's something that is really important. And just got about 30 many seconds VC left. Yeah, forgive me. Go ahead. Many VC firms make decision by consensus. You know what consensus is? Yeah. It's like six people together in the same room have to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where the problem lies, as my research shows. So to resolve this problem, um, to diversify the founders, we need to change how we make decisions in groups. And again, this is the part of the venture mindset principles agree to disagree interesting really interesting oh my gosh what a great way um to wrap up uh really enjoyed this conversation um thank you so much for stopping by and spending some time with us uh, that is of course professor Ilya strebuleyev uh his new book is the venture mindset how to make smarter bets and achieve extraordinary growth he's professor of private equity and finance at stanford university's graduate school of business and the founder and director of the venture capital initiative we didn't even really get into private equity which would be a whole other it's got to come back conversation Got to come back I and bet, visit us. I bet he has thoughts on private credit, too. I bet he does. All right. Maybe when it comes out, um, soft cover. Okay. Or we'll go to California and do something. Uh, on it. We're yeah. done. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. 
Last year in the U.S., startups founded exclusively by women accounted for only 2% of all funding that was invested in VC-backed startups. This is according to the World Economic Forum. In Europe, the numbers even worse. Only 1.8% of the capital raised went to female-founded startups. As we heard in our last segment, the most successful venture capitalists tend to respond more to women entrepreneurs, which raises the question, why hasn't that led to significant gains in funding for women-led startups? Yeah, why hasn't it? All right, well, that is the world of Joanne Corcoran, co-chief executive officer and managing partner at Golden Seeds, a network of angel investors that exclusively invests in early-stage women-led companies. Some good things have happened for women in the angel markets, okay? I mean, the last 20 years since Golden Seeds started has been um, phenomenally good for women in the angel markets. You know, 20 years ago, women got 3% of the capital. Now, women founders and co-founders get about 40% of the angel capital. And the most important thing is that the yield, the percentage of companies that seek funding that actually get it, is it's just about comparable now for male and female entrepreneurs in the angel market. So that's really great progress in the angel markets. And, uh, you know, why did that happen? I think a lot of the reason for that is that angels in the U.S., you know, individuals who invest in startup companies, about 40 percent of those people are now women. And that's up, you know, about, I don't know, more than 10 times since when we started in 2004. So that's really great. I, I would imagine somebody listening right now might have the question, from a returns perspective, if you're trying to maximize returns, why would you restrict yourself in any way by the types of companies you can invest in? There's equity issues are one thing, but there is research that say that women are better stewards of capital. I mean, there was a big study put together in, 20, in 2019 by Boston Consulting and Mass Challenge that said that, um, and that's a huge data set, that said that women entrepreneurs generate two times the revenue per dollar of capital invested. So there is research that say that you want to look at diverse founders. One thing I do think about when it comes to um, angel investing, right? You know, you can throw a little bit of money at a business, right? And it really can kind of get going, especially in this environment where technology and, you know, social and so on and so forth is so much a part of sometimes a business getting going. Having said that, how many of the angel investments that get made in your world, how many of them actually turn into something that either gets sold or is fairly profitable? In the angel business and the venture business, we know that about 35% of companies don't return all the capital. We know that. Yeah. In venture, I've seen studies that said it's you know half. In our 20 years of experience, we've had just about 30% of companies who haven't returned capital, but the rest of our companies, in fact, I looked at it just the other day, of all the money that we've invested, 100% of it has come back in aggregate to our investors and there's unrealized gains in the comp in the existing operating companies of about another 79%. Yeah. And on average our companies are still only a couple of years old. Our thanks to Joanne Corcoran, co-chief executive officer and managing partner over at Golden Seeds. In a related story, 23andMe co-founder and CEO Ann Wojcicki once had to make the rounds of investors and venture capitalists. That was nearly 20 years ago. Today, the company seems to be facing an existential threat. After years of mass market genetic testing that was designed to read a person's DNA code to address the risk for future diseases and live to 100 years old, as it turns out, it's a lot more complicated than just spitting in a tube. For 23andMe, it's become more Geno hype than Geno promise, and that's affecting the company's bottom line. This is the cover story of the current issue of Bloomberg Business Week, reported by Bloomberg News healthcare reporter Kristen V. Brown. They're trying to, for some of these things, do what's called a polygenic risk score and say, based on all of these genes, you might have a risk. But it winds up being more like you're slightly more elevated to risk, not an actual roadmap for what do you do to stay healthy and live to 100. And in a small portion of the folks who do the test, it does come back with some sort of result that says, OK, you do have the characteristics of, of this sort of genetic variant. But then treatment for that, as you note in your story, can be incredibly expensive. 
Right. Monogenic diseases. There's a lot of them. There's a single gene that causes a disease. There's a lot of them, but they're usually very, very rare. And because they're rare and the therapies are also very complicated, you know, fancy high tech things, they're expensive, small population, small market. So we have gotten a few of these therapies so far, but definitely not the therapies that we expected for very common diseases like Alzheimer's, like cancer. So we've gotten therapies that have a small market and so therefore they're really, really pricey. We talk about people spitting in a tube. Um, I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands uh, in the control room we're here, but you did I did it, yeah. I I did not do it. I have spit in so many tubes in the course of my journalism career, but I did for this particular story too. And it wasn't the typical 23andMe $20 thing, right? This This is a very high high tech test. Yeah, so 23andMe's latest offering is it's doing sequencing, not genotyping, which is a fancier, they're literally decoding every little bit of all of the protein coding regions of your genome, which are the ones that we think cause disease. In doing that, they really hope to get this really holistic, nuanced picture of the genome. For me, in the sequencing, they actually didn't find anything. And then in the genotyping, which is a sort of more low budget option, they found that I might be at risk risk for celiac disease, but I can tell you I had avocado toast this morning for breakfast. Doing just fine. It went fine. fine. Okay. It went fine. So um, so for me, at least, this is a uh, almost a thousand dollar test. And I learned that I might have a disease that I don't have. So I don't know. I well, did like, you do anything about that? Like, I'm curious, did it cause you to say, well, maybe I'll have a doctor look into this? Well, you know, usually if you have celiac disease, you know, you yeah. have a violent yeah. reaction when you eat gluten. So I was, I felt pretty confident. I also said I might one day develop glaucoma. I have a slightly increased risk, but um, you can't actually do anything about that. So it's, it's, I don't know what to do with that knowledge. So I felt like I should have spent that thousand dollars on some shoes instead, maybe. I don't know. Preach it to the choir. <laughs> well, the medical community, right, has been, to some extent, they haven't embraced this idea. No. So, I mean, is that part of the problem? Is it just a case that it's complicated and maybe it is the right idea? Or what's the kind of feedback on this? I wrote this story because I started wondering, for the decade I have covered this topic, people have told me, you know, this is the year genetics is going to catch on. This is the year. This is finally the year. No, this year. And it just, <laughs> it just never happened. And so I started asking some of my longtime sources, you know, is this, is this happening? You know, what's, what's the status here, guys? And I was surprised to hear from many people who had been boosters for the genome, who, who were now saying, we're not sure it's ever mm, going to happen. That's and amazing. I, yeah. And, and, you know, with, with science, you never, you never know, maybe right. we'll turn a corner, we'll find something that will suddenly unlock everything. But based on what we know now, it does feel like it's just so complicated that for the average healthy person, there won't be value really in getting a genetic screen. Now, if you have a history of cancer in your family, mm-hmm. if you want to become a parent and you want to make sure you don't have any genetic conditions lurking in your genome, you could pass on that stuff all worth it. But if you're just an average healthy person trying to live their best life, it just really seems like there's not going to be value in these tests. It raises the question about what the future is for 23andMe, and that's a big part of your cover story for Bloomberg Business Week. the idea that the stock has been under pressure over the last few years, down more than 94% over that period of time. Richard Branson lost over $100 million on yeah. it going public. What is the future for 23andMe as a business? They're in a real tough spot. They um, just got an extension to try and get their stock back up over a dollar. They have until, I believe, November to do that. The concern is that they'll be delisted. Yeah, the concern is that they will be delisted. And I think in a move to prevent that from happening, uh, CEO Ann Wojcicki has filed an intent to... um, take the company private herself to you know buy it buy it back basically so that could be one thing we see but i think that you know it's a really rocky road ahead for them well you know it's interesting and i don't know is this a company that might benefit being private in terms of having the time the luxury maybe the money you know to kind of figure this out Based on what the stock did when uh, she filed that 8K, I would say that the market thinks it would benefit from from going private. It's 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 a hard company because it's part consumer, part drug development, and yeah. and the investors in those two different kinds of companies. Anne has said this herself. They kind of have different expectations, so it's a weird 
blend of things. And that has created an additional challenge on top of, you know, having a consumer product that a lot of consumers maybe don't want anymore. <laughs> so what about the data and the data breaches um, that we've heard about the security of this information? I mean, years ago, years ago, I'm mean, going to say my mom was right. She was like, why would I want to give a company this type of information once it's out there? And I, I was actually defending. I was saying, no, you know, these, you know, this type of stuff stays safe. Fast forward a few years, there's a big data breach. Anne has said that she thinks that privacy concerns has been one of the reasons kit sales have slowed. She said that in the past. And, you know, that could definitely be what's going on. One analyst joked to me that 23andMe would probably do better to just give the kit away for free in mm. exchange for getting people's data because that is the most valuable Especially asset they have. How much we've talked about generative AI and you think about the more data that comes into the pool, whether or not that can help kind of be a turning point, like more yeah. information. I mean, they have 15 million genomes. That is one of the biggest genetic databases mm -hmm. on par with Ancestry and the you know country of China. So that's a, that's really valuable. And so if they can keep growing that asset, that could be big. And to be clear, there was a data breach of people's personal yes. information. Yes, there was a data breach yeah. that had personal, and it did contain some genetic information. Um, any questions that you still have? You've reported this story out, and you're thinking about it. What questions are still kind of top of mind for you? Yeah, I mean, I think I think for me, you know, uh, having covered this field for a decade, it was sort of an existential crisis to actually do this story and be, you know, questioning whether this thing that I have covered for a decade really doesn't matter. So yeah. I think that I just want to see how this science unfolds and what value we will wind up getting from the genome. Because I don't think that it's going to wind up having been for not that we sequenced the hu human genome 20 years ago. But I think what we're going to get isn't what we expected. So yeah. that's still to be written. It's fascinating. I remember kind of early on in my career, like, you know, they'd map something and we'd do a story. And then when they finally completed it, like it was just like, wow, you know, now we have all the information, what we can do with it. But here we are. Here we are. Here we are. More to come. That means more stories from you, more cover stories. Bloomberg News healthcare reporter Kristen V. Brown uh, on this week's Bloomberg Business Week cover story, which you can get online on the Bloomberg and catch it also on the newsstand. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Listen live each weekday starting at 2 p.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plenty ahead in our second hour of the weekend edition of Bloomberg Business Week, including the activewear apparel brand that's been focused on men for years, now embracing the better sex. I can kind of say that, don't you think? I think you can. I might get some mail. Um... I'm not going to push back. <laughs> All right. Anyway, I've been hammering them for years about this. We check in with Nate Checkett's of Roan in just a minute. Plus, homing in on the UK, including its answer to the hit Netflix series, Selling Sunset, Mayfair, anyone. <laughs> we get into the buying and selling of London's most expensive homes. As well as where to go for more affordable weekend getaways outside of London. And a favorite conversation of mine about sailing alone on the high seas. It's all in a new book on the surprising history of isolation and survival at sea. First up this hour, a look at the athletic wear space. Roan, the active wear apparel brand, backed by Blackstone executive David Blitzer, former hedge fund manager Gabe Plotkin, and ex-football star Tim Tebow, and more. It was founded back in 2014 as a men's only brand. It's a private company, and it's been profitable for the past three years, eclipsing $100 million in annual run rate. And now with a big announcement, they are out with a women's line. And it's really fun because I've been pressuring like, when are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? Because we've been talking to him for years. It launched earlier this month. We got more with Nate Checkets. He's the co-founder and CEO of Roan. We did a capsule collection back in 2019 on International Women's Day. Right. And the thought was, OK, this will be a little test. We'll see how the market reacts to it. And it went well. And then, of course, we have a global pandemic the next year. So we decided not to anniversary it. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, we pulled back. And then, really, we made the decision two and a half years ago, OK, we need to do this, but let's do it the right way. Let's think through every aspect. And it impacts everything from store layout to mannequins to models to the brand marketing. How are you shifting the message? So we really brought in best in class talent across every aspect of the business and mm -hmm. starting most importantly with the product. And it just takes a while to do it right. Is it hard from a communications perspective because you've been known for a decade as being a place for men and perhaps customers might walk by a store and say, well, I'm not going to go in there because they don't have 
product necessarily for me. Yeah, I think that has been the brand marketing challenge. And I think if you look at the industry, there are certainly brands who have done this very well, shifted from men's to women's or women's into men's. Uh, but then there have been brands who have taken some big missteps in that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we were adamant about from the beginning is this is not taking our men's product and creating women's product. This is creating, taking our customer putting her at the center of the journey and making product uniquely for her, unique fabrications, unique fits, unique cuts. And that it can be, the, the lines can be complementary, but they're not meant to be symmetrical. Is it more difficult in terms of creating a women's line versus a men's line? There's certainly a lot more competition. Yeah. And I think there's more pressure to have newness and be on trend and fashion. We joke in the men's space, it's like, well, make sure you have black, navy, and gray, and you're fine. Uh, but <laughs> but even the men's space has, has evolved over the last several years, and men are, are more kind of fashion forward and leaning into trend and style. So we brought in uh, really a best-in-class team on the merchandising and the styling and the design side and we're really seeing it on the initial reaction we launched an early access yesterday and in the first day we started breaking on a couple of styles meaning we were selling out of a few key sizes which we had not anticipated to happen for the first four weeks so the reaction has been just unbelievable what's the ultimate goal for revenue mix for this is it do you want this to be 50 50 do you want women to be mm -hmm. 60 40 we've done a three-year model and we see a path to getting the the brand to a 50 50 mix uh, women are obviously more prolific shoppers than men. They're just better at it. They know. They Stop know that. They, I hear that at home. <laughs> they, know, they, they know what they want and uh, and they, you know, they're willing to lean in and try new things. I think the challenge is if you can get a male c customer, you can keep him generally a lot longer. He tends to go back to what he knows and likes. He's harder to get. That's uh, the men are lazy. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's a good, good interpretation. Like, we know what we like. You tend like, to like yeah. what you like. Exactly. exactly. Right. But women, you have to earn that next purchase every single time and we take that seriously. So uh, to us, it starts at the fabric level, the quality of what we do. And uh, I think as we put hands, you know, everything from our fit model to our actual yeah. um, fashion models, they've said, you know, they work with every brand in the market and they're like, this is the softest, best fabric I've ever felt. So we, we think we're doing something right. How do you go after getting the female customer, women customers versus men? Like, I'm curious, what was your approach? Well, we have a, a slight advantage here versus a, a new brand, which is we already have a big database of women. 30% of our men's product was being purchased by women, uh, which is about the inverse of some of the big public, more female-led brands. Right. It's usually like the opposite of that. But we had a database of active female shoppers. And then we've just been very strategic about going out targeting who we think she is um, on social, building up some anticipation, some great PR. We've had a lot of incredible press. And it, you know, it's not, this is not a one month thing. This is a, yeah. we've learned in 10 years, you've got to keep consistent. I think one of the things that we have really prided ourselves on as we've built this line is almost every active brand is based in, on the West Coast. And there is mm -hmm. definitely a West Coast aesthetic. And what I've said internally is, since when was New York not the capital, fashion capital of the world? So we try and bring a New York aesthetic and trend and focus into active, but we start with a root of performance at the center of what we do versus taking kind of a ready to wear and then trying to use active fabrics. We combine the best of both worlds to kind of bring that to the market. And I think the other big focus for us is how do we make her powerful, strong, independent. We think a lot of these brands look the same because it's all yoga, endless hours of yoga loops. But we think our customer is, maybe she's sneaking yoga in in 15, 20 minutes and she's working hard, she's taking care of people, she's strong, she's independent. And we wanna position her that way versus you've got two hours in a yoga studio to do whatever you want because none of our customers live that way. Athleisure is obviously a term that has gained a lot of importance in the market. The way we think about athleisure is it's made to look athletic, but you can't actually work out in it. Yeah. So we call it performance lifestyle, which is you can do anything in our clothes. You know, you, you know I've run a marathon in our dress shirt. You can literally do anything, but yeah. you, you're going to look professional when you wear it. When it comes to the women's line, I mean, the the more active formal line that you had for that you developed for men's came a little later than that first active wear stuff. Are you 
following a similar timeline or are you gonna kind of release everything right now? No, we're following a very similar flow, which is let's root ourselves in performance. So it, the, the initial line you'll see is very active, focused, a lot of course to court. Um, you may have heard we signed the LPGA as we're the official yeah. on-course mm -hmm. apparel partner there. So you'll see us on a lot of green grass accounts, tennis courts, pickleball courts, and then a lot of the lifestyle will start to be added in afterwards. Do you still have fun doing this? Oh my gosh, I'm having the most fun I've ever had right now. It's 10 years and certainly I've had periods of founder burnout, but I think since we took back full control of the business and we really kind of started to chart our own destiny, it just changed the way we feel about it. You took back full control 18 months ago, roughly. Yep. Um, yeah. Didn't make it public though until just last fall. Yeah. Um, give us an, an update on the business uh, since taking full control. Well, last year was our biggest absolute growth year ever. Um, and the business is growing almost twice as fast this year. Yeah. Uh, so we feel really encouraged about that decision and the team that we've put into place and the investment in people. I, we have big growth goals, so we still feel like we're in the early innings of where this can go, but uh, it's been a journey, 10 years. So expanding into women, you still talk about growth going forward, 10 years in, what's the next 10 years? Like, how do you think about it? Yeah, well. Sorry, uh, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I think the thing that I am most excited about is we have, from the beginning of our customer journey, we have focused on what we call mental fitness which is really just an emphasis on mental health, taking care of yourself both physically and mentally. When we came into the active market, you would see all of these marketing messages of, you are an athlete, lift more weight, run faster, jump higher. And we think there's such a missing aspect of recovery and taking care of yourself and the space mm -hmm. between your ears. And that is a very unique problem in the men's market. So it was an easy area to focus on, but everybody needs to talk about this. And what's great is the female customer is already naturally so much better at talking about it. Mm -hmm. So doing this together with our team has been really, really helpful and powerful. So what I'm most excited about for the next 10 years is to be able to supercharge that. And so we've got some big, exciting plans in terms of how we're gonna do that, how we're gonna bring that to the market, and some of the unique things that we think about about being a wellness company first that just happens to sell clothes. Wow. Was that in your ethos yeah. from the very beginning, or, or did, did that kind of transition happen over the pandemic? Yeah, it has been part of the DNA from the beginning. I think during the pandemic, we were able to crystallize what that mission was. And part of it was having my own you know, crisis going through some of that with the pandemic. But we have always believed that wellness is much more than aesthetic physical fitness, which is really where I think most of these brands focus on with a hyper level of focus on professional athlete endorsements. Uh, we just love this idea that teaching people how to take care of themselves is the best way to feel good. And part of that is having a uniform that you feel excited and energized, but also enabling and empowering the conversation. We've hosted hundreds of these events that we call mind and muscle events, which mm -hmm. are 25 minute body weight workouts followed by a group discussion, which is really like a group therapy conversation. Mm -hmm. And that format exists in Alcoholics Anonymous, it exists in a number of different formats, but it's been so successful in men's and we've had like groundbreaking moments with so many guys and it just enables them to feel comfortable talking about these things. It's my passion. Like that's yeah. the thing that gets me the most excited. And yes, I think we make the best clothes in our category and the best clothes in our market that enables us to have a megaphone. And so we've got to grow the size of our megaphone to have the level of impact that we want. But our growth goal is to be a billion dollar revenue business and impact a hundred million lives through um, our education. It's fascinating to hear you say like thinking of yourself I mean, like you said, it's from the beginning, but as a wellness company, kind of with clothes attached, if you will. I mean, how else do you, I mean, is it a case that there are other offerings, Nate, that you eventually offer to your customers even more so? That's the goal. From the beginning, we had uh, an online journal that we called The Pursuit, which mm -hmm. focused a lot on this, bringing world-class experts to the table, sharing that content. But what we found is that this idea of uh, you guys are in the content business. You know how hard it is. Yeah. And so we were competing against advertised driven content engines. And this was like 
something that we were doing on the site. So now we've taken that back in-house and figured out how to do this in a way that we think is sustainable and meeting the customer where they're at in the form of video content and yeah. social first content versus written content. And then also live events and doing, you know, leaning more into that, that I think will be really powerful. Can you give us an update on retail locations? Because one thing that we talked about with you last mm. time you were here was growth of retail at yep. a time when we're seeing other companies pull back. Yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering how aggressive you're being this year when it comes to that retail footprint and, and what portion right now comes from e-commerce versus those brick and mortars. Retail has been our fastest growing channel the last two years uh, on a percent basis. And I think it's a channel we certainly believe in. We are slowing that down this year because of the women's launch. As you can imagine, it changes the layout of the store, the size of the store, right. the mannequins, the hangers, the training of the staff, the selection of the staff. Like there's just so many considerations. So we kind of want to absorb and Because every store has to have a retrofit, right? Exactly. So yeah. we're retrofitting all 15 stores. Yeah. We've kind of done that work, brought in you know the right people from a visual merchant standpoint but our store plan going forward is as aggressive as it was in 2023 and we think that these stores are really important especially for our brand message because you have to meet people where they are and mm -hmm. meeting people in person and physically we've all learned the importance of that over the last several years so we're leaning into that and doing it the right way. We're gonna be highly selective. There are certainly a lot of brands in our space that because of their capital stack and what they need to achieve, they're yeah. juicing their revenue numbers by opening as many stores as possible. Oh, and in some cases overpaying for real estate, which is gonna to be tough in three to five years when those, those rates you know, don't justify um, the sales figures. We're not taking that tactic. We're being really thoughtful, but we're gonna, you know, our our store count will be more than two x by twenty twenty six. Forgive me, and I should know this. Wholesale, you guys don't want. We like, do have some wholesale. Bit, yeah, right? we've got some great partners um, in the market. We we have a high focus on specialty accounts, green grass accounts. You know, okay. we're in some of the best golf and country clubs. Productive for you guys, or is it absolutely? Just, yeah. I think it's a great business model. You can get carried away when you're driven when you're wholesale account is driven by majors. For us, it's been about 20% of the business wow. the last two years, so it's it's small. Um, Equinox was an early partner. Yeah. Equinox still was an early partner, partner still a partner, and uh, and you know we love that type of account because generally if you walk into an Equinox and you buy shorts, it's because you forgot shorts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nobody's like, hey, you know what, I'm gonna go have that be my retail experience, or I would say that's the minority, but- You just do it. <laughs> it's perfect, and it's a great way for people to discover the brand and the product. You don't right. wanna use the gym loaner shorts. All right, so here I go, Nate kids <laughs> yeah i i won't say never my wife's been begging for that from the beginning but i think she'll i think she'll give me a minute because <laughs> sorry uh, wait to, to, just to clarify you have kids already you're talking about a kid's line kids, yeah. line. Okay. kids line okay yeah fair fair thanks tim yeah no problem um, but uh but yeah so you, you never know but i i surprised my wife uh on the day that we launched and i had just flown in from asia i, I arrived at 3 a.m and i set up a room in our house with every single one of the products for her and then I brought her in and surprised her and so I think she'll give me I think she'll give me a year <laughs> off uh, before bothering me about kids again well done well done thank you um, Nate always great to check in with you good luck with it thank you we great look forward you guys. to hearing more thanks for having yeah, me always. See you, Nate, Nate Checkets he's co-founder and CEO of Roan joining us here in studio all right everybody you've been listening and watching Bloomberg Business Week Carol Masser Tim Stenovic and this is Bloomberg You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. All right, so my husband and I are sailors. You guys probably know that I talk about it a lot, I know, but um, we have been for over 30 years and some of our favorite moments are being out on the water. No one's around us for what seems like miles. However, coastlines and land is often still in sight. Neither of us have done serious offshore sailing or crossed an ocean alone, something that many others have done. Not yet. 
Yeah, that's right. We still have time. Uh, It is those solo sailors, both men and women, who have ventured out single-handed that really know what it's like to be truly alone out on the ocean and often for days, Tim. Our next guest has crossed the Atlantic in his 28-foot sloop Fox. Richard King writes about it, weaving his journey through those of other sailors who have sailed out of sight of land and alone. It's all Carol in his new book, Sailing Alone, A Surprising History of Isolation and Survival at Sea. All right, Richard, needless to say, uh, this has been a fun thing, and I've been looking forward to it. My producer, uh, Paul Brennan, like, was like, you, you gave me the book a while ago, so it's been fun. Uh, we've been counting down the days to you. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, tell us about, first of all, you are a sailor. You've gone at it alone on a boat across uh, the ocean. But tell us why you wanted to kind of put this together, tell your story, but also tell the story of many other sailors who've done that as well. Sure, and thanks a lot, Carol and Tim, for having me on. And Carol, I'm looking forward to hearing about your adventures. (laughs) Um, I I sailed uh, by myself in 2007 across the Atlantic, and I definitely don't see myself as a super sailor. Um, You know, it was a little bit of a bungling affair. Um, And in some ways, going out of sight of land, you know, off the coast is easier, right? You know, there's there's less to hit and uh, less to keep track of. Um, but I did it for a couple different reasons, and that was one of the things that I explore in this book. You know, I'm really telling the history of people that have gone to sea by themselves and crossed oceans by themselves since at least the early 1700s and all the way up to today. And so I was trying to explore, like, why did people go? Why would they go? Um, and then also what they saw out there, just like you did in that intro, Carol, like, what is it like to be out at sea by yourself on a quiet boat, really close to the surface day after day and really getting that connection to the ocean world? Well, and I love that, the book about, you know, why they go, what they see. So when you took your trip across the Atlantic on Fox, your 28 foot sloop, what did you, or what, why did you go specifically um, Um, And what did you see? Yeah, I went, I was in graduate school at the time and I studied literature of the sea. I'm actually more of a scholar than, you know, a a sailor. And I'd spend so much time reading about these experiences. And I was like, you know, maybe, maybe I could do that. And um, uh, so I put, I'm really proud of sort of the logistics of the voyage, not necessarily the execution, um, but I did make (laughs) it. And, uh, you know, some of the things that I saw out there uh, was just a really close connection with some of the seabirds, particularly storm petrels. Mm -hmm. I had one moment, um, which I, you know, many of the listeners will sort of connect with where I was fishing off the back of the boat and I saw a fin coming behind me, a really large dorsal fin. And I kind of freaked out. I was like, oh my gosh, Jaws is going to like leap right (laughs) on top of the boat and, you know, eat me up. And, you know, I I quickly went down below and I took pictures and I grabbed my boat hook as if I was going to, you know, stab it in the eye or something like that. And then later when I look at the pictures, I realized it was this tiny little fin. It probably wasn't (laughs) even a shark. It might have been like a pilot whale or something. Uh, But, you know, you just really get that sort of intense connection, uh, particularly the nights at sea and the sunrises and sunsets. And uh, it's, you know, it's a rare privileged experience, really. Maybe because I'm an anxious New Yorker. Um, I'm just wondering about the anxiety of being out there. It's so it's so calm. I know it's calm, but. Well, there's this feeling that I have. I'm not a sailor. I've sailed before, but I would not consider myself a sailor of not being in control of when you can get back on land. And that part of this totally freaks me out here. Were there any moments out there that you just found yourself terrified? (laughs) Like when the engine died on that trip across the Atlantic? Yeah, Tim, totally. I would say 90% of the time I was was an anxious wreck and my people are also from New York, so (laughs) I have that stream. Okay. Um, You know, I think, uh, and that's really, the the book is really about some of these great sailors who have gotten over that first anxious experience. I kind of never did. I did my first trip across the Atlantic and then afterwards I was like, okay, I think think I'm good. But I do kind of wish that I had continued on because you look at some of the really extraordinary historical sailors, Bernard Mortissier, Robin Knox Johnson, Ellen MacArthur, um, even, you know, the early ones like Joshua Slocum, who got over those initial anxious moments and then were able to carry on and really be calm and really enjoy themselves at sea. And often that's when 
you know, these sailors really got these experiences in the natural world where they could finally relax and not have to worry so much about, you know, this thing breaking or there's something always breaking on a boat. You know that (laughs) it's always breaking. Well, what's the joke? They say it's like hours and hours of boredom broken up by, you know, minutes or seconds of just sheer terror and chaos. And that's kind of sailing, right? Because it's really quiet out there. And then you have to go into harbor and you have to dock. And it's like there's always something that's going to go wrong. That's right. And, you know, for a big part for solo sailors, uh, trying to steer the boat and trying to get rest is a big part of it. And so one of the things I talk about in the book is sort of the development of various technologies that have made it a little bit easier for solo sailors, whether it's GPS or fiberglass or the marine engine. But self-steering mechanisms, whether they're wind-based or electrical, have made a huge difference. You had a wind. Um, But even in my case. Did you have a wind vane? That's what you used, right, to go across? That's right. I had two different types of steering. I had a wind vane self-steering, um, which you know doesn't require any power or any fuel, and that is about the most magical device on the planet. That was developed sort of you know in the 1950s and 60s um, uh, for recreational boats, and that was just amazing. But it but it that requires that's based on relative wind. So if you went to sleep for two hours and you got up, the boat is adjusting itself based on the angle of the wind. So if the wind shifts, your boat is going to change. Um, and then I also had a little e- electrical tiller pilot, um, okay. which you could set to a compass point. I'm, I'm curious about the the reasons behind this and how, not necessarily yours, which I want to get to, but the way that they've shifted over time, because as you mentioned in the 1700s, a lot of this was exploration. It was in search of riches. It was in search of, you know, at that point, not necessarily new lands, but sort of, right? The great exploration of the seas and of the, of the earth. But these days, a lot of it is about recreation and it's about sort of personal challenges. And I'm, and I'm wondering how you can characterize the evolution of why someone would do this. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great point. And that's certainly something I sort of trace through going over time because, you know, that the whole idea that going sailing by yourself across an ocean, that that isn't completely just a bananas, idiotic kind of thing, that this idea that over time people start to respect that is a sort of interesting transition. And you do see sort of blips, you know, everybody is different and everybody's complex about whether they're escaping a family situation or they are trying to make money or they're trying to make fame for themselves. But you do see sort of these sort of blips of where there's more recreational sailing and then even more solo sailing. Um, One of these blips is right after World War II. And I focus the book a lot, sort of frame it on Ann Davidson, who's the first um, woman that we know of to sail alone across an ocean. And she sails in 1952. Um, and she's part of this whole surge of people from Europe, from North America, from all around the world that really are going out to the ocean and seeking that sort of respite, that sort of perception that the ocean is a clean, unhampered space, particularly after the trauma of World War II. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating, right, to, to kind of hear what they sought out, right, to help them through it. Um, I want to go back to something you said earlier, and that was, I think, the first um, solo circumnavigator, or or who was actually, let me let you pick the story that you just were really drawn to, because there's older folks, folks a long time ago, there's teenagers, which I'm always blown away by someone who's a teenager who gets in a book and their parents are in a boat and their parents are like, yeah, go for it. I think about, there was a Netflix uh, movie just on Jessica Watson, uh, an Australian teenager, and it's it's kind of wild. Yeah, I, Jessica Watson is fantastic. And I think one of the things that I talk a lot about in the book is this relationship between being a writer, because going to see, you know, maybe even for you, Carol, even when you go out just for an afternoon or for a day, it's a literary endeavor. You're keeping a log book, you, maybe you're writing mm-hmm. a note, you're writing a letter, you're reading about other sailors. And so this, it's this very sort of almost all of these people that are going sailing alone are also thinking about it artistically. And some of them are thinking about writing a book even before they've, they've left. And so someone like Bernard Martissier, uh, who in the 1960s was the first to sail solo nonstop around the world, one and a half times around the world um, (laughs) in the late sixties. And he, for him, from the very start, it was about making a book, about crafting this work of nature writing, not even as much about the expedition itself. It was like as if Thoreau, you know, was climbing Everest. Um, um, 
Just got about a minute left here. I mean, 30 years of sailing, we saw our first whale play with us in a boat off of Rhode Island um, just this past summer. And my husband and I looked at us, maybe it's time to sell the boat because it was just so unbelievable. (laughs) But you have about a minute left here. Is there a moment in time where you just, I don't know, a little story before we go, unfortunately? Sure. Yeah, I think um, one interesting story is, you know, if you're watching in the news, you're seeing orcas that are damaging boats off Gibraltar um, that are actually seem to be knocking into recreational boats. Um, And one thing that you learn from the history is that's been happening for a while. And one uh, former New Yorker, Teddy Seymour, uh, born in Yonkers, the first uh, black sailor to sail alone around the world. And he was uh, knocked by an orca off the Red Sea for about a half a day. But uh, luckily, just kind of banged into his self-steering gear. Um, but he tells a great story of it. <laughs> I, I got to tell you, we watch the Orca videos and we watch all these people, whether it's the YouTubers, Project Atticus or Vagabond or, you know, my husband and I are obsessed with it. And you get to get a feel of what it's like to be out on the ocean. Professor, just 15 seconds left. Would you do it again? Uh, I think I do it with, with friends. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. That's what I, you know, that's what most of them do. And some of them have a couple kids and they're going around the world, but they eventually on some of those big crossings bring friends on. Um, this was so much fun. I hope we get a chance to talk again and maybe you will buy. Do you have a boat now? Don't. Yeah. If anyone would like to donate one, I'm available. <laughs> well said, well said. Richard King, uh, his book is Sailing Alone, A Surprising History of Isolation and Survival at Sea. Uh, joining us from Santa Cruz, California, a great place to go sailing. No doubt about that. <laughs> Richard Visiting, Professor of Maritime <laughs> History and Literature with the Sea Education Association. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. We're all in on the UK this week, including a new show out from Netflix, which has swapped the Hollywood Hills for the manicured squares of Mayfair in its new real estate show, Buying London. The UK's answer to the popular Selling Sunset reality program. More on the new Netflix real estate show, Buying London, in just a minute, thanks to Bloomberg Pursuits, the British take this week. Everything from London's most expensive homes to the beachside breaks and cozy countryside stays outside the city of London that are, yes, kind of affordable. (laughs) It's all relative. All right, also the best shows and musicals to see on London's West End. Let's get to it with us. The editor of Bloomberg Pursuits, Chris Rouser, along with Sarah Rappaport. She is Bloomberg News luxury reporter. She is based in London. Chris, I feel like you guys are doing a lot on London this year or Europe in general. Yeah, we've been looking a lot at Europe for the summer, particularly. Uh, I think people are thinking about Europe because of the Paris Olympics, and then people are like, nah, ah. I don't want to go deal with all that. Uh, and so we have been you know, publishing lots of stories about alternatives and where places that you may not think of going, places that may not be so expensive. Uh, and Sarah is based in London, and she is... Has a great job. uh, Has a great job. Luxury. When you said luxury reporter, I was like, yeah, that does sound really good. Um, Not a bad gig, yeah. (laughs) uh, And she specializes in uh, real estate and travel and also something that's very close to her in my heart, uh, theater. So she's got a lot of fun stuff for the summer. Okay, I want to start with travel before we get to real estate and then theater. So, So Sarah, you wrote about the best affordable new weekend getaways from London that are ready to book right now. And And before we get into all of them. I want to just tell you what stuck out to me as an American who struggles with public transportation in the United (laughs) States. All of these are so accessible by train and then an easy cab ride. This is amazing. Yeah, they're all under three hours away from London. On a train. You know, bring a book, you know, hop on a train and you're there. So you're not sitting in traffic like all New Yorkers do trying to get somewhere. Like, I That's know. a luxury, mm-hmm. Carol. I know. It sounds It sounds it's incredible. Less than the Hamptons drive, right? Exactly. Well, so talk to us a little bit about of kind of where that led you to and how you, you thought about kind of what you wanted to highlight. Yeah, well, I think London right now can be quite expensive. We have a trend of rooms going for like a thousand pounds a night, which is like twelve hundred bucks. But there are some really nice hotels you can get to outside of London that are more expensive than they were previously, but still affordable luxury. So 300 pounds, which is like $500, is is the top year. So there's a really cool new place in Oxford called The Store. And it was in the first department store actually in Oxford. And it's outside all the colleges. From the rooftop, you can actually see all the famous spires and fancy buildings and all the people going to take their exams or have a drink in the bar and watch the students going around. And that's really special because I love Oxford. 
it's a very special place in the UK, and it's only an hour away from London. I love that they have posters from the former department store that are still kind of hanging on their walls and just kind of incorporated into the design. It just kind of sounds very unique. The cool, like, yeah, 1920s outfits. They actually found them during the reno. Sarah, tell us about Boys Hall. It sounds like the place for me and Tim. <laughs> it's where we belong. <laughs> That's where we should go. <laughs> Yeah, so it was a renovated manor house from the 1600s. Charles <laughs> I actually stayed there. You can get a room for under 200 pounds. There's no spa and there's only nine rooms. But you can have a glass of wine in the gardens, watch the world go by. It's in a very cool, wisteria clad manor house. Like, think dark woods everywhere. Like, it's allegedly haunted. I, I stayed there. I didn't see any ghosts. I just had a nice time. But I love the history of all the old English manor houses. I think that's especially for, like, Americans when we want to go to the English countryside. That's what we want. Stay in an old house. It feels yes. very old. Definitely see a ghost and have a glass yeah. of wine. It's <laughs> much older than America, and it's only, like, less than an hour away as well. Okay, but, so let's say, Sarah, if you're not necessarily inter- into the, interested in the idea of the countryside, what about the seaside? What are the options for that? I mean, like, heads up, it might be cold and rainy. <laughs> you're not exactly Shocking. South Florida vibes. <laughs> yeah. There's this place I like called Number 42 in Margate. That's a five minutes away from the Turner Art Museum, and it's absolutely gorgeous. They have free snacks from a little um, retrofitted ticket booth. So you can get popcorn and ice cream at midnight, which I'm into. And there's a yeah, beachside vibe, like open terraces. Just like a really chill experience, less than an hour and a half from London. I want to go back to London for a minute, if we can, because we before we kicked off, we highlighted a little bit of this Netflix uh, Netflix's new real estate show, uh, Buying London. Chris, first of all, I mean, I got to tell you, I kind of love these high-end real estate shows. I just love watching them wherever the heck they are. I, I do too. I really, I mean, there's there's one in New York that's really um, just called Open House New York, which is just like nice houses. And then Selling Sunset and shows like that out of Hollywood are like really more about the drama and the outfits. Yeah. And that can be fun. It can <laughs> also be They're always made tiring. up and everybody's manicured perfectly. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. They show up for, for the office like that at, yeah, at 9 a.m. Um, just like me. <laughs> and, but not. You know, that isn't like a, a thing that has really translated into the London, uh, like UK and Europe versions of that of that show it can it's a little more like peaceful mm-hmm. and so uh, Sarah has a story about a new show that's kind of trying to combine the drama with the uh, high-end real estate okay so Sarah let's talk a little bit about that and and let's start with just who this guy Daniel Daggers is because if there's somebody with a perfect <gasps> name for mm, high-powered real estate <laughs> broker made up, but yeah <laughs> Daniel Daggers was Daniel literally Daggers. born for this job <laughs> He was, yeah. He was actually delightful in person, though. He got maybe a little bit of a villain edit on TV, but a very nice guy in person. And I met him at his offices, which were not the ones that you saw on Netflix, actually. Netflix got another office with better light to film in. Mm, of course. Some secrets, <laughs> some secrets yeah. from the show. Okay. Shocking. It's secrets not real. Show, yeah. I thought it was reality TV. Yeah. Real. So what kind of range of houses are they selling? Like, What are we talking about? So he calls himself Mr. Super Prime, which in London means 10 million pounds and above. So the upper echelons of London real estate. Think, you know, Mayfair Mansions, kind of sprawling Notting Hill manors. On the show, they're selling one that used to belong to Salma Hayek. She's not on the show, but I guess she stayed there or lived in it once. Wait, he really didn't have enough um, closet real estate for her. She needed bigger closets, which is why she sold it. I totally get that. Totally yeah. get that. Wait, he has sold more than five and a half billion dollars of real estate, including what a hundred and twenty million dollar mansion to Ken Griffin. Yes, and that was one of the biggest real estate transactions of the, of the year a few years ago. That one. Can you talk a little bit about how he ended up having his own firm? Because there's a little bit of story there. There is a little bit of a story there, and this is under NDA, so he wouldn't give me details about it. But That he means did you know at- it's good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He worked at Night Frank, which for 12 years, he's been a partner there in their super prime division, and allegedly posted a picture of a client's house that was publicly available on Instagram, where he has thousands and thousands of followers, and this person allegedly wasn't happy about it, so he departed Night Frank. But his social media superstardom has made him, you know, a Netflix star, so it all paid off in the end. So he started his own firm after leaving Night Frank. And that range of real estate, though, hasn't been doing super well lately, right? No, it hasn't. It's a bit of a slowdown. People with the mega mansions have been having to cut up to 30% in order to get a sale. Even in the spring, which is traditionally a very busy time in London, it's been called a little lackluster. Big deals aren't really happening at the same pace they used to be. Yeah, it's pretty shocking. I feel like some of the, I mean, this is a fun story and a you know personality, no doubt about it, and a, a reality show on, you know, 
super luxe real estate, but it's also talking about some of the prices when you come to London properties. You say in January, prime central London properties sold below 90% of their asking price for the first time since early 2019. That's some data from um, uh, Lund Rest. But I mean, Tim, we've talked about this, right? Yeah. Some of the high-end luxury markets around the world, especially like in London, have really, it's a, it's quite a market correction. You know, it's different depending on the market you're talking about. We totally. certainly are still seeing some pretty high-end stuff go in other parts of the world. But Sarah, I'm curious if that matters to the audience uh, that's intended for this? Like, does, do they care what's going on in the real estate market? Or is that reflected in the show? Does it make the show different? You know what? I'm not sure they do. I mean, I asked Daniel Daggers about this, and he said, you know, maybe it's great time for buyers now. People will watch the show and get in contact with him, you know, super rich in other places who want a London house. <laughs> so I'm not sure it matters to the audience who are also there for, you know, the fun outfits, the drama, the scripted tours inside houses they might never see. Um, hey, listen, uh, Chris, if we're in London, we got to go to the West End. <laughs> yes, you do. And Sarah sees, I mean, I love to go to London and Sarah tells me what shows to see. Um, and, you know, every season she does a preview of what shows, not just in the West End, but every every kind of show uh, that you should see. And she did a spring preview uh, a little while ago and she's going to do a summer preview coming up. And last week she saw one of the big shows, which was Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, starring Spider-Man himself, Tom Holland. It was his first time in the st- on the stage as an adult. He did Billy Elliot as a kid, but it was his first time back as a grown-up. And the tickets sold out how fast? Two hours. Yeah. It's a limited run, but it was a very, very hot commodity. Um, and it's this director, Jamie Lloyd, who did Sunset Boulevard, who has this kind of like very stark modern approach to theater where they use camera work and stuff and and that his huge production of Sunset Boulevard is coming uh, to New York with Nicole Scherzinger from the Pussycat Dolls so you guys should all see it. <gasps> kind of like it's that. incredible. Um, it's one of the best things I've seen since Sunset Boulevard. Speaking of a hot commodity we got to talk about the picture of Dorian Gray because <gasps> this sounds amazing especially for fans of Succession. Oh my god yeah Sarah Snook is incredible She's coming to Broadway next year. And that's a one woman show. And I don't know how she does it. Like, it, it's a really a tour de force and just like pure athleticism for an actor. And that uses a lot of camera work, too, to show basically every angle of her face as the portrait ages. And she, yeah, she plays everyone in the play, in the book. Is she going to be on Broadway? Yes. Yeah, 2025. I know, I mean, right? You got to like, get tickets for that like, now. Honest thing, yeah. Like, do it now. Yeah, 26 roles, right? One woman show. It's unbelievable. Uh, and she's won awards for it. Um, just one last thought in terms of any other shows that you want to highlight from uh, that's going on in London right now. Yeah, well, Operation Mincemeat is still on for big fans of, um, it's actually a quite funny musical comedy about a World War II intelligence operation, which doesn't sound like it would make for a good comedy. <laughs> but actually, you're like, okay, right. But it's actually the funniest thing I've ever seen. We're all like, yeah, I don't I know can't wait to see that. It did win, right? A, a new musical. Um, yeah, Best New Musical at the Olivier, which yeah. is the British Tonys. Sarah, if you ever want to do like a job switch just for a few months, <laughs> come here, co anchor Bloomberg Business Week. I'll be luxury reporter. That sounds pretty good. Sarah did do a job switch. She was a TV producer that wrote for us in her spare time, and she was so good at it that they transferred her to our team. So, uh-huh. Tim, if you All want right. to start writing for pursuits, I'm just saying, <laughs> hey, you know where I live. <laughs> All right, that's going to leave it. Hey, listen, guys, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.